and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a third round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol voice acting competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. If you'd like to hear more of this contestant, voting for them is simple and only takes a moment. Just click the thumbs up icon. Can't stand them? Then click the thumbs down icon instead and cast them into the digital nether realm from whence they came. You decide their fate. Good luck to all of our contestants. Meal Deal by Ian Sputnik. First published in Sanitarium Magazine, issue number 33. Read by Kristen Holland. Albert James Kinlock and his wife Dorothy sat at their dining table and went through the options. Ooh, how about this one? Dot suggested. The nag's head. Let's have a look, love, he replied, taking the latest issue of the Real Ale Drinker's Guide from his wife. No, 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 come on, love, it's part of a chain. We need to get to the real pubs, not these silly mock ones. The ones which have been bought out by these big companies are soulless. They're so busy and full of tourists, and not what we're really looking for. I'm sorry, honey, you're right, of course. Perhaps this isn't the guide we really need to be reading. Eureka! Bert shouted, which made Dot almost jump out of her skin. What on God's earth? So sorry, my sweet, he apologised. Listen to this. Off the beaten track. Proper drinking taverns for proper drinking people. This looks like the perfect guide. No chains, no high streets, no all-day breakfasts, and hopefully no damn jukebox. Proper old taverns frequented by proper old locals. Inbred is well-bred, after all. Dot chuckled along at his little quip. Sounds perfect. Where can we get a copy? There's a phone number. Love, where's the bank card? Bert was a distinguished-looking man. His hair was short and neat, albeit slightly peppered. He was tall and trim. His face was wizened, although not too old-looking. In fact, you would be hard put to guess his age, just a number to Bert, and not a particularly important one at that. His wife was much the same, minus the peppered hair colouring. Hers was a magnificent Titian, immaculately kept. Together, they made for a very handsome couple in the twilight years of their lives. Within a week, Dot shuffled into the living room, where Bert was finishing off his bacon sandwich and cup of tea. It's here, she shrieked excitedly, smacking down the large envelope. Bert spared no time in tearing the guide from its packaging. Together, they perused the pages. Within five minutes, both their gazes were drawn to an article. Man of Kent was the headline. A traditional pub away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. This drinking establishment stocks an exceptional range of real ales and ciders from small independent breweries within the UK and Europe. The little watering hole is a trek and a half to gain access to, miles from the local train station, and only served by a none too frequent or reliable bus service. But if you've got the resolve to get there, then you won't be disappointed. A perfect start to our mini tour, Bert announced. Dot agreed. They decided to make the journey on Friday night. Friday always being the best night for a good drink, they both agreed. They also made a special effort to get an early night on Thursday in preparation for the long and arduous trip ahead of them. Come Friday, their little home was a den of activity as Bert gathered waterproof clothing and packed it in their little travel backpacks together with maps, timetables and the like. Dot made sandwiches for the journey and two flasks of hot drinks. Just before they left, she reminded him of the marking papers You'd forget your head if it weren't screwed on, she complained. Then they were on their way. The journey from Essex was rather long. The onward trains from London to Kent took even longer. They had to change at least three times, and when they got to the little railway station in Kent, they discovered that the bus service for Friday had been cancelled due to mechanical problems. Oh well, Bert said in a resigned voice. Looks like we're walking the rest of the way, love. He reached into his backpack and retrieved one of the maps. Shouldn't take that long, he assured his wife. Dot smiled back at him. They had been together for an age and a half, or so it seemed, so an hour or so walk wouldn't make much difference. Although the walk was long, it was not unpleasant. The roads meandered through some of the nicest countryside in Britain. Huge meadows and farmland as far as the eye could see. 
This was the Garden of England, after all, for that is what the country of Kent had been nicknamed. There was a natural calmness to the area. Apart from the occasional squawk of a crow, all was completely silent. It was October, and the clouds were dark and low. Rain seemed imminent. Bert hoped that they would make it to their destination before the heavens opened up, and his wife, obviously, agreed. After getting lost once or twice, Bert pointed and shouted, There it is! In the distance, on an otherwise deserted little road, one dimly lit building shone out like a beacon of hope. Within five minutes, they entered the little oasis. The place was nigh on deserted, which Bert and Dot were not particularly bothered about. They preferred to sample a pub's wares in relative quietness. They only needed a few people to frequent an establishment to help give it the atmosphere that they sought. Good evening, sir, the landlord said in a welcoming voice. Looks like you made it just in time. I think the weather's just about going to take a turn for the worse. What will it be? Bert and Dot took several moments to peruse what beverages were on offer. I'll have a pint of old driver, and the wife will have half a mantis. That'll be five pound thirty, replied the landlord. Bert reached into his trouser pocket and pulled his wallet loose. It took some doing due to the girth of the leather pouch, and when he opened it, the landlord could see why. It was completely stuffed full with a large wad of notes. From what he could see, there must have been quite a few hundred pounds, maybe thousands. Bert offered him one of the notes. I'm so sorry, he apologised, but a twenty is the smallest I have. Planning on making a long session of it, are we, sir? The landlord joked. What? Oh, no, I see. No, no, no. The good wife and I are starting on a week-long tour of little independent inns, like your own fair establishment, so we can sample the flavours of local brews. This will be just one stop of many in our sortie into the Kent countryside. After paying, Bert struggled to squeeze the wallet back into his pocket and rejoined his wife, who was sitting waiting patiently at a small table in one of the pub's small alcoves. The time was about 5pm, and although not yet night, the gathering dark storm clouds gave the feeling that the hour was much later. After three drinks, Bert offered the landlord one. Well, thank you, kind sir, he responded. The other half a dozen local drinkers, who had regarded the two non-locals with nothing but disdain since the moment they had arrived, eyed Bert up and down. They chuckled quietly amongst themselves. I'll bring him over to you, he offered. He approached Bert and Dot with all three drinks on a tray and joined them, after asking if that was okay. He then initiated conversation with these two new, jumped-up strangers, although he didn't call them that to their faces. Where had they come from? How did they get here without the bus running? Where were they staying that night? And so on. Don't your family and friends worry about you two out and about at your ages, if you don't mind me asking? Not that I'm suggesting that you're too old to be out on your own, he inquired. Well, sir, Bert made to reply. Oh, please, call me Jerry. Sorry, but Jerry, the fact of the matter is, we were never blessed with children. And as for friends, well, we rather like to keep ourselves to ourselves. Thought that we might board here for the evening, if you have a room that isn't bought. Well, as you can see, we're not exactly in peak season at the moment. He then let out a small chortle. As he said so, Jerry looked over his shoulder to the small group of locals who were now gathered around the nearest corner of the serving counter. They laughed as well. Jerry probed and probed more about their plans, and Bert answered as best he could. Excuse me, please, Jerry apologised. Just a little bit of business to attend to. He explained as he looked over to the woman who had recently taken over his serving duties. Bert and Dot presumed that this new arrival must be his wife. Bert rejected his apology, explaining that they had probably taken up too much of his time anyway, and it should be them apologising to him. Jerry, in return, offered them both a drink on the house. It's a pleasure to talk to you, he explained. We don't get too many strangers passing through here, and I'll only be a moment anyway. I'll just see about that room for you while I'm at it. Jerry approached the bar and muttered a few words into his wife's ear. She nodded and, looking over to the old couple, smiled sweetly before starting to pour the drinks. Within a few moments, Jerry returned with the refreshments. Nah, get that down, you both. As they drank, Jerry's wife made her way to the customer's side of the bar and proceeded to start shutting the curtains. The chat in the pub ceased and silence 
seemed to fill the room. As the curtains were being drawn, one of the local men walked over to the door and pulled across the heavy metal bolt at the top and then the bottom. He also turned the hanging sign from open to closed before pulling a curtain across the door. Bert and Dot stood up and retrieved their bags from the floor. They then slowly retreated into the farthest corner of the pub. Perhaps we'd best be on our way after all, Bert said. The couple then reached into their bags and hurriedly started putting on their raincoats and waterproof trousers. We've got friends quite nearby who are expecting us. I'm sure they won't mind putting us up for the night as well. Don't want to put you to any trouble. Well, you see, that's not really true, Bert, is it? Jerry replied. See, you've already told me exactly what I needed to know. You keep yourselves to yourselves. No close friends, no family. So nobody's expecting you at all, are they? The landlord's manner had suddenly changed, and not for the better. And as for trouble, well, seems like you've got enough of that yourselves, haven't you? If it's our money you're after, just take it. Dot offered. No need for any violence. Not as easy as that. A large grin spread from ear to ear across Jerry's face. Can't really have you two go telling tales now, can we? So you might as well take them coats off, because you ain't going anywhere. Not now. Not ever. The rain's the last of your worries, my newest best friends. He cackled. With that, Jerry and the locals began to bear down upon them, several of them now openly brandishing knives. One put a show of slowly passing his blade across his own throat in a mock representation of their intentions. Things aren't being too easy round here, you see. That fair wad of notes will pay my rent on this place for a few months, and the boys here will get a bit of pocket money out of it as well. Well, we gave you every chance to do the decent thing, Bert said. And for your information, the waterproofs we've put on aren't to keep the rain out. It's to keep the blood off our clothes. Blood can be such a tiresome thing to remove, don't you think? As Jerry and his gang of thugs looked at each other with a mixture of amusement and bemusement, both Bert and his wife dropped to the floor. The skin from their faces split open as enlarged canine jaws, complete with razor-sharp teeth, burst forth. Their fingers stretched into claws, and their ears into long, hairy points. Jerry had not even the time to make a sound as Dot made the first lunge. She was on him in an instant. The gang of locals were frozen in pure horror as blood spurted up the walls and across the ceiling. Her face burrowed deep into his guts as she fed hungrily. One of the gang shook himself from his stupor and headed for the door, but he was too slow. In a single bound, the creature that had once been Bert was blocking his exit. In one snap of his jaws, the local drinker's head was separated from his body. It rolled across the floor, leaving a trail of blood as it went. Screaming and panic ensued, with blood spraying liberally around the room as limbs were severed in a frenzy of snapping jaws and swiping claws. The landlady was the last local standing. She had backed herself into a corner and screamed pleas of mercy to the approaching pair of beasts. They paused for a brief moment before looking at each other and letting out mocking, hyena-like laughter. They pounced. The creatures that were formerly Bert and Dot then spent the evening gorging on flesh and lapping up the blood as it flowed freely from the corpses that lay broken and dismembered around the public house. They then settled on the crimson-soaked floor and groomed each other's faces to remove any last morsel of human remains. After such a feast, they then fell into a comfortable sleep. Come morning, the couple awoke back in human form. They removed their waterproof PVC coats and trousers, and Dot took them to the toilets to rinse off the blood. Bert, in the meantime, took the opportunity to empty the pockets and wallets of locals. He then emptied the till of the evening's takings. Finally, he sat at the table that had received the least in the way of blood and gore soiling, and retrieved one of the marking papers from his backpack. Dot joined him within a few minutes. So what do you think? asked Bert. I would say a slightly woody taste with a hint of assholes, she replied. 
They laughed in unison as Bert filled in, man of Kent, slightly woody, with undertones of asshole. Before leaving, Bert made his way into the kitchen and turned the gas hob on. After turning each knob to maximum, he lit a small fire in the bar area and joined his wife outside. They then made their way, slowly but purposefully, to the train station. It was still dark, but thankfully not raining. Once they arrived, they found that they had at least three quarters of an hour before the first train of the day was due to arrive. This gave them ample opportunity to pick their next destination. So, what's the next drinking hole, my lover? Dot asked. How about the Mackland Arms in Raynham? Ooh, farming stock, she cooed. They always have a nice, earthy aftertaste. She then noticed that Bert gave a slight shiver. Oh, honey, I think I've got just the thing to ward off a chill before it starts. She retrieved the two flasks that she had prepared and packed the day before, unscrewed them, and peered into each. A slight waft of steam escaped from both as the contents came in contact with the frigid early morning air. Oh, good, still nice and warm, she gushed. This'll put hairs in your chest. After smelling each, she asked, A, B, negative, or O, positive, dear? Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on September 23rd, based on your votes, the top five contestants will progress to the fourth and final round to take place live on October 31st at our annual Halloween live stream event, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.